let people in in the back, but I'd like to welcome everybody today to our Benavia Educational Workshop Series. I am uh, your Benavia host, Jay Lickus. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Benavia. And uh, today's topic is threats to your family's financial future. And uh, we have a most amazing host here today, uh, our CARES program expert, senior care partner, Laura Johnson with Johnson and Associates. You wanna wave so everybody knows what square you're in? Kind of the Hollywood Squares things we do on <laughs> balls. Uh, Laura was raised in Phoenix. She attended ASU and received her Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and graduated from the Barrett's Barrett Honors College. She also earned her Juris Doctorate from ASU. She focuses in the areas of estate planning, small business planning, elder law, and Medicaid long-term care planning. Laura has been practicing elder law since 2000 and opened her own practice in 2006. She enjoys doing community service with various local women's groups, serves on the Regional Leadership Council for the Alzheimer's Association, serves on the board of the directors for the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, and is on the board right here at Benavia. And we thank her for that. So I'm gonna go over a couple of quick housekeeping tips before we get started so that we can make this a little bit smoother. I'm sure all of you guys are Zoom experts by now and know your way around your screen, but um, right now, if you can't tell, I have everybody muted and um, you should be able to find your audio button. There's a little microphone. Can you see that in the lower part of your screen? To the lower left, if you're using a PC, could be anywhere on an Apple. They like to change that one around. <laughs> but if you click on the, um, the microphone, you can mute and unmute yourself, or you can just raise your hand and I can do it from my end as well. And then right next to the microphone is a video cam button. And that will allow you to show us the screen and we can see your beautiful face or you can click on it and stop your video. And then we'll just see a black screen with your name on it. So we love to see everybody, especially when you're asking questions. So uh, make sure you know where that button is. Uh, if we have any questions, like Laura said earlier, um, we're gonna cover a lot of material today, a lot of important stuff. So. At any time, if you want to ask a question and it, it's relevant to the topic we're in the middle of, then please just raise your hand. Or at the bottom, you'll see a little smiley face with a um, plus sign, and that's your reaction button. You can raise your hand there by clicking on the, the yellow hand, or you can put your question in the chat box. And you'll see a thought bubble right in the middle of the screen in the bottom that says chat. You can click on that and type in whatever question you have. You can attach files, do whatever your heart desires, and we'll get to that question. I'll monitor the chat box to make sure that Laura is up, uh, up to date on any questions going on. So don't be bashful. This is an interactive workshop. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want to answer your questions. We want to make sure you guys get the right information today to help you. So um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to Laura. And if you want to talk a little bit about yourself and your company, Laura, to get everybody kind of acclimated, so we're all brothers and sisters here, um, <laughs> and then we'll start the presentation. So, Laura. Okay. Let's see. So, I, I'm Laura Johnson, as Jay was saying, and I appreciate the opportunity to have some of your time today. Um, let's see. There's a little bit about me. I. I have interesting things. Um, my Well, my office is in Avondale and I live in North Peoria. So I kind of go through Sun City, Sun City West, Surprise, all of that um, as I come to work each day. So I have a lot of clients in that area. I have five grandchildren and five children. And I finally get to go on my first trip to Italy. We've been waiting for three years to go. We bought tickets right before COVID, so I'm excited about that. So if anybody has any recommendations, let me know. I, I want to know where you're going, Laura, because we just got back in Did January you? from Italy. We're doing Venice and Florence this time. Oh, uh, so, well, yeah. Florence, was, Florence was the best. Okay, thank yes. you. So if you have any suggestions, let me know. Certainly. 
So, so my job was just kind of to talk about where we have risk um, as we go through and we age. And I want to, and, and I don't usually, you know, talk in a negative way, but I'll try to focus on that and just kind of tell you where things are. So sometimes I usually start with um, just explaining, sometimes people don't know where community resources are and that's super important as you age. So knowing that you have these resources to reach out to, that they're free, um, all federal money um, from the government right now, their goal is to keep people home at long, as long as possible so that they can mitigate those expenses if someone, you know, if the state is paying for that person to be in a nursing home setting or assisted living. So that all of that money goes to what's called the Air Agency on Aging. And then they give grant money out to other institutions like Benavia, like Alzheimer's Association, um, Parkinson's, things like that. So if you, if you needed um, something like you said, if we could just have this one thing um, a recommendation for someone who could put grab bars in our bathroom or meals on wheels, you know, once a week or something like that. That would be the organization you could start with. Benavia also has a um, team that you can call and they can also refer you out to different uh, community resources. So just an idea of different places you can get help um, that are free. Also, don't ever be afraid of hospice. Hospice has a couple different programs you can participate in. It's free through your Medicare. Even if you're not medically eligible, most hospices now have palliative programs that you can participate in and they can provide medicine, um, different things like that at no cost so that um, they can mitigate some of those expenses as you age. And if you're a caregiver and your next door neighbor says, hey, can I help you out? What should your answer be? Everybody nod your head like this, yes. So use your friends and your neighbors and people who volunteer to help you out. Um, I think that's also super important. Okay, so today we're gonna talk a little bit about all of the legal planning and um, what you need to have in place. Uh, and what it does and what happens if you don't have it in place. So these are the terms that we use that make us super smart, right? And Jay's gonna tell me if we have a question, right? I can't really. Okay. Yeah, hi, uh, right in the middle of a webinar. Okay, so someone needs to mute. Okay, there we go. So, so the first thing we're gonna talk about a little bit is a healthcare power of attorney. So that's the document that says who makes your personal decisions. We have a statute in Arizona called a surrogacy statute. So if someone doesn't have a healthcare power of attorney, there's a list of who can make those decisions for you. Um, and, and it's the legislature's best guess as to who you would want. So sometimes it's the right person like your spouse, um, my spouse is not my healthcare power of attorney. Um, so sometimes, but you can opt out of what the legislature says by doing a healthcare power of attorney. Sometimes it's really important to do a healthcare power of attorney because you want to pick the right person. So I have five kids. So if, if I go by the surrogacy statute and all five of them are going to make a decision about end of life things, or if I should be moved into a facility, what do you think the likelihood of them all green is? See, you shake your head like this. <laughs> it's not happening. So it's really important that I don't, I don't want to, this is not the time to be politically correct and not be able to choose someone or worry about who's mad because I need someone to make that decision in that moment. So I need to pick someone and I, can, and I can put a secondary person on there if that person's not willing to do that or they're not available. I can put a third person on there. I can put a fourth person. But if I name them all together, then I've just basically kicked the can down the road and we're gonna, because we're, if there's a disagreement among all those people, then we're going to go to court to settle it. So pick one person, put it on there. The healthcare power of attorney is not effective unless I'm incapacitated. 
So if the doctor's talking to me and he feels like I'm not understanding what he's saying or I'm not making good decisions, then he's going to defer to my healthcare power of attorney agent. And, and so that, that needs, so if I say to my husband, this is what I want. And he says, I don't know if I can do that for you. What should I do? Pick someone else, right? So I need to have that person be someone that understands what I want and that I know will carry through with, with what my request is. In Arizona, we also have a mental health care power of attorney. So if we have out of state documents, which are valid and will be honored in Arizona as long as they're executed properly and as long as they don't have something that we don't allow for in Arizona, like um, physician-assisted suicide, for example, we don't accommodate for here. So as long as we're not asking for that, uh, Arizona will honor a healthcare power of attorney from out of state. But almost never will the healthcare power of attorney say, this person can admit me to an inpatient lockdown psych unit. And Arizona has five geriatric psych units that are just for people as they age, they have dementia, um, and they do a really good job of, you know, someone's in the group home, they get scared, they lash out at someone, they can't keep them there, they take them in, give them psych medicines, and then they'll release them and Medicare covers that for that short period of time. So in order to have that person admitted, we have to have this mental health care power of attorney. So if you have documents from out of state, you can go to the Arizona Attorney General's website and print this form out and add it to your other documents. If you don't do that, you're going to be admitted anyway on a 48 hour hold, and then they're going to make your family go to court on an emergency basis. So if we're talking about affecting your financial future, it's going to be easily, most of the time in a situation like this, we're going to spend $30,000 or so on attorney's fees. So 50 cents, if you print it out from the, from the attorney general's office, sign it, put it with your other paperwork, and it's, it's worth its weight in gold. So super, super important. Okay. Then because, because the healthcare power of attorney is never effective unless we're inca incapacitated, sometimes we're kind of on that edge. And so if my kids go to the doctor and they say, my, our mom has been making some crazy decisions. She, you know, she's buying stuff. She's playing the lottery. She's never done that before. She doesn't have enough money for her groceries. Can you write us a letter so we can, you know, take over for her? Um, the doctor's going to say, your mom's an attorney. I don't think so, right? Unless he looks at his paperwork and there's a medical release for them so that they can talk to him. So you can have a medical release within your health care power of attorney, but that's not going to be effective unless you're incapacitated usually. So it's really important that when you go to the doctor each year and they give you all that paperwork to fill out, it'll say, who can we talk to? And then it's really important to put on that paperwork who all of your different agents are so that they can get that information and talk to them. If we don't have the medical release, sometimes we're going to have to go to court, especially if I look healthy and like I'm doing well. So sometimes we'll have a situation where maybe somebody just has had strokes to the front part of their brain. So they've lost their ability to logically think, but everything else they can do so the deficits aren't obvious like someone who has normal dementia. So if we're fighting about whether I'm capacitated or not, it becomes a, a whole discussion between the doctors and we don't have this, this um, medical release, then we have to go to court to order that release of information, which is gonna cost several thousand dollars, which is never fun. It's never fun to waste money on attorney's fees that aren't productive. So make sure that your, what you're doing in your healthcare power of attorney um, matches what you're doing with your doctor's office so they know who to talk to if, if anything happens. Hey, Laura, and, we, have we have a question in the chat sure. box on that. Sure. Um, it says, my understanding is that the Arizona healthcare power of attorney was revised a few years ago. 
Do those with older versions need to update their healthcare POAs? That's a good question. So it was actually just revised again, um, probably less than six months ago. So no, it doesn't. The, the attorney general was trying to make it a little bit more um, user-friendly and, and they had some different selections in the old mental health care power of attorney that were confusing to people. So they were trying to simplify it so that it wouldn't be filled out incorrectly. So if you filled it out, that's great. You don't have to redo it. The other nice thing about the healthcare powers of attorney and the mental is that it doesn't even have to be notarized. You can just have a witness um, witness it. It has a place for either, but um, it needs either a witness or a notary. Just make sure the witness isn't related to anyone um, so they have no interest in signing it. But that's a good question. So no, um, there, there used to be a little a place where you could fill out that said it was revocable or irrevocable and it made people nervous to check irrevocable. But then when you go to use it, the person was usually upset so that they can verbally revoke it. So no one wanted to sign that, but you really needed to sign it. So they just took out that option is basically what they did. Um, so perfect, okay. And we're gonna go. So then we're gonna talk about the living will. And this is the this is the document that a lot of times people get confused with because you have a living trust, you have a last will and testament, you have a living will, and, and they all do very different things. So the living will is the document that says, I uh, if I have a terminal condition, if I'm in a persistent vegetative state and I cannot direct what I want. I don't want these things. So I don't want, you know, blood transfusions or, you know, chemotherapy or what, whatever the case may be. Usually in Arizona, it's really important to say, if that's the situation, do you want foods and fluids that could artificially prolong your life? And do you want to be kept alive on a ventilator? Um, so that can be as specific or as general as you want, um, depending on what your experience is and what you feel comfortable putting in there. It's not a DNR because the DNR says my heart stops beating today. Don't call 911 no matter what, even if even if I would be fine. That's on orange paper. You have to put your picture on it. It has to be posted um, because the first responders have to make a pretty quick judgment about what to do if they're needing that. And you have to have the original with you for them to see it. So with the living will, that's just kind of a precursor that says, if this stuff happens, then don't resuscitate me, um, which is in the in light of COVID and, uh, and ventilators being a preferred treatment for that. The DNR makes a lot of people nervous that maybe they wouldn't be put on a ventilator if there's limited um, access. So always have the living will um, and then and then um, do the DNR later if you really truly feel like you wouldn't want that treatment under any circumstances. There's also a new-ish form called a pulsed, and that's on hot pink paper that goes into your uh, medical record, and it very specifically outlines, I want this, I don't want this. Uh, and so if you have lots of different medical conditions and you wanna make it very clear what treatments you want, especially in light of that, then you can um, have your physician fill out this pulse and put it in your record. It's not as common in Arizona because we don't have a statute that talks about it, but it is honored in Arizona and it's nice because it follows you as part of your, me your medical record. We, we also have a free document storage in Arizona for all of your healthcare documents. So all of these documents can be sent into the Arizona Secretary of State's office. They will send you a card back um, through a company called Health Current, and then you can carry that card. Like I just had a colonoscopy. They asked me if I had advanced directives. I just give them the card and they can look at my healthcare power of attorney, mental healthcare power of attorney, and living will. It's all, it's all in there, which is nice. Um, and eventually the platform will be built so that first responders can look in there as well as um, hospitals and things like that. So some hospitals like ones that are in Sun City do a good job of asking people um, for those documents and storing them. So if they come back in, they have them. 
but most hospitals don't. So this will stop that situation where everybody says, well, I, I think we have one, but we can't find it. And I don't know where it is. And you can send a copy of this to your decision makers so that if there is an emergency and me and my husband get in an accident together, my daughter can just go to the hospital and she has everything she needs to prove that, you know, they should talk to her and stuff like that. So it's a great, it's a great idea. Later in the PowerPoint presentation, the website for that registry is on there. Um, so you'll have it. So we have powers of attorney are only good during lifetime. And they give that person the authority to act as if they were me. When I pass away, the powers of attorney aren't valid anymore. So they stop. And so during my lifetime, I name someone who can make my medical decisions if I can't. But then I also have to do a separate power of attorney for finances and all my stuff. And sometimes those people that I name are the same and sometimes they're not. So there's an additional power of attorney. You'll usually hear it called a durable financial power of attorney or a general durable power of attorney or something like that. And that says, this is the person who should make all my decisions, who can talk to the cell phone company, who can, even if you have a trust, you'll still have this power of attorney because we need someone to be able to access IRAs and things like that. This can be effective right away. So I could say, you know, my husband's my power of attorney. If he wants to sign for me, he can. That doesn't take away my right to sign for myself. Or if I'm going to make it my son, he, it can be effective later, you know, when I need it. So then he has to take that extra step, if that's the case, to go do what the power of attorney says before he can take over. You have to get two letters from the doctor saying she's incapacitated or, or whatever the power of attorney says. And it can say a lot of different things. If I have a lot of, if I have a long mental health history, sometimes I'll say, you know, these are the people who can tell if I'm capacitated or not. So if they get together and they decide, then, you know, that's, that's how that works. Um, the, the financial power of attorney is really important that it outlines everything the person can do. Because if I'm a mortgage, I mean, how many of you have heard crazy stories about family members misusing powers of attorney? Yeah, every week I hear a great one. So it's really important that, you know, the, the bank doesn't want to be sued. The financial institution doesn't want to be sued. So when someone walks in with the financial power of attorney and they're taking out all, all the money out of my bank account to do something with it, the the bank is always suspect of that so if the power of attorney doesn't specifically say something that they can hang their hat on they're going to be nervous to honor that power of attorney so it's really important that it's very specific about what the person can do and it doesn't tie their hands in any way especially gifting if we're trying to do like long-term care planning um, if you have a financial power of attorney from another state Arizona will honor it as long as you have one witness and one notary. So that, that's really important um, to just double check. Usually with the financial power of attorney, you have to have the original document with you when you're trying to use it. Um, with the healthcare power of attorney, most of the time you don't. So any questions about powers of attorney? We have some. Let's see. All right. I think we're good. Okay. Then go to our next one. So then, then when someone passes away, we we control that part of how everything happens, either with a will or a trust or beneficiary designations, or we can do it with joint, joint ownership. So I can, I can have a piece of property in joint tenancy with my husband. That means that we both own it. If I pass away, it goes to me. If he passes away, it goes, if I pass away, it goes to him. If he passes away, it goes to me. So the survivor wins. Um, you can have community property with rights of survivorship in Arizona. Um, 
and, and that just passes it directly to each other. I can put beneficiaries on my accounts. So um, I can say my daughter's my beneficiary. Usually that's called a POD payable on death or transferable on death. Uh, and then the minute I pass away, that's a direct contract on that account and it goes to that person. So if we, so if we don't have beneficiaries or we don't have joint owners, then those assets have to go to probate because the bank or, or the who's ever handling the real property debt needs to make sure that the right person is signing and, and that they're not going to be liable for releasing that to that person. So if I have a will, then that gets submitted to the probate and that person has to follow that will. If I don't have a will, then we say we're what's called intestate and we don't have a will. Probate is the process that Laura Johnson passed away, something was in her name, and we need official paperwork to get those things out of her name. We can't get that transfer made without that. So if I have a beneficiary designation, it goes according to that, not the will. So for example, if I say um, my bank account, and if I write a will and I say in my will, my bank account should go to my son, but then I go to Bank of America and I put my daughter on the account as my POD beneficiary, my daughter gets the account, not my son. So the will only comes in and is able to grab assets that don't have that designation on them. And that's important because when you open up an account, you get nervous or something and you put someone on it with you. Like I, I'm nervous and I just wanna make sure my daughter can access my account as I age so she can pay for my funeral or whatever. If, if that happens and I put her on the account as a signer, then that's like having a power of attorney on there. So when I pass away, she can no longer sign on the account and the account's frozen uh, and it will then go to the beneficiary. And if I have no beneficiary, then it goes to probate. If I put my daughter on as a joint owner, then she owns the account with me. She gets divorced, she, her kids get in a car accident, anything like that happens. And my account is now subject to that. So. Most of the time, I would want her on as a signer, and then I put a beneficiary on the account for after we pass away so that it doesn't have to go through probate. But it just depends on what we're trying to accomplish. So if I have beneficiaries on everything, I still want to do a will because I need something that can handle my personal property items, as well as, you know, we always have surprises like we get refund checks or um, we get money, you know, paychecks, back paychecks, or we, you know, I pass away in a horrible car accident and now there's a lawsuit. So money comes in from that. So all of those things will come through the estate. It won't be clear who the beneficiary is. So I need the will to just make sure it goes to the right people. If it's under 75,000, I can use that will and just do an affidavit and collect those funds. If it's over 75,000, then I have to file it with the court and go through that process. Um, if it's real property, it's 100,000. Also, if I have any beneficiaries that are in that will that, or even that aren't in the will that are going to be the beneficiaries under the law, if they're under 18, then um, their parents have to go get a conservatorship for them and the court monitors their inheritance. And then when they're 18, regardless of how they're doing, that money has to be released to them. So sometimes if we have special needs beneficiaries or if we have younger beneficiaries or things like that, then we want to use a trust for that. Um, so I had, I had a situation where um, uh, someone had lost their wife and his friend had lost her husband and they were kind of supporting each other. And um, he got really sick and he sold his house and they were going to get married and move in together. And so he put his $300,000. Now I guess it would be 600,000, right? <laughs> so he put that in the account and he said to her, you know, we're going to get married. And then he got really sick and he ended up in the hospital and then in rehab and a group home and then the hospital so during that time, they called an attorney to the home 
and he did a will and he named her as the beneficiary. And um, he passed away while he was in there and she went into the bank to access that money. And the daughter who never showed up during this whole process had been named the beneficiary of that account when he originally set it up 30 years before and he just had forgotten. And so she was able to collect that account um, and the, the partner that had been taking care of him for those five years that he was sick wasn't able to get, even though the will said that. So it's really important that when you're doing your planning that your beneficiaries match what you're trying to do. Okay. So Hello, then, you go want ahead. to stop for a couple questions? Okay, yeah. We've got some in the chat box here. Let's see, okay. Does FPO cover property transfer? So what's FPO? Financial power of attorney? I believe yes. so. Yes, so if, it, if the financial power of attorney says on it, um, this person can sell my property, that's why it's really important to be very specific. This person can sell property. This person can apply for benefits for me. This person can mortgage my property. This person can close accounts. They can set up trust for me. They can, um, all of that, um, super important. So yes, it does cover property transfers most of the time. You can have a very specific one that says, I just want my husband to sign for the close of this property. That's a limited power of attorney. Um, so you can put a beneficiary on your property. It's called a beneficiary deed. And, and probably half the states right now have something like that. And it's really, it's a really awesome option. So if I have one daughter and I want her to get my property when I pass away, instead of setting up a trust or, you know, doing anything like that, I can just name her as a beneficiary and record that on the property. She's not an owner. I can sell it. But if I pass, I just, she records my death certificate and she's automatically the owner. Um, so we do, most attorneys do beneficiary deeds. Sometimes title companies will do them, but not, not for the most part. Um, so that's where you have to do those. The nice thing about, well, the tough thing about beneficiary deeds is if I put my five kids on my bank account, the bank solicits each of them separately and says, hey, you're going to get a fifth of this account. Tell me what you want me to do with it. And then they can each do different things and they don't have to get together to come to a consensus. If I have a property and I put my five kids on it as the beneficiary, if I pass and they record my death certificate and one wants to use it as an Airbnb and one wants to sell it and one's just sad that I passed away so they think all the other kids are horrible and they don't want to do anything with it. And and one wants to buy it, but they can't get the financing and, and they, they can't agree on a price, then basically all I've done is create a situation where they're going to go to court and litigate on it anyway. So it's really important that you think about who you're putting on there as beneficiaries and do they all get along? And if they don't, you know, don't use a beneficiary deed, you might still want to use a trust. Um, we have a condo that's not in a will even um, so if you have a comp it doesn't have to say spe these specific assets go to these specific people in a will um, you just say when I pass away all my stuff gets split like this so if you have the condo it goes that direction if you don't and it'll almost always be liquidated unless it has a beneficiary on it uh, so the question is is there so so is there, is a trust necessary if you just have one beneficiary? So it depends. It depends on who the one beneficiary is. So here's this list that I kind of talk through with my clients and try to figure out if they have any hot spots. So if I have some specific tax situations that I'm trying to work on, then like say I'm leaving money to my son who has IRS liens against him or um, different things like that, I might wanna use a trust. Say I wanna leave them, say I just have one piece of property, but I want my daughter in charge of selling it. And then, and I want her to be able to have money to use for expenses first. 
and then she can distribute it out to the five. Because sometimes what happens is I put beneficiaries on everything and then she's the responsible one and she goes to the other beneficiaries and she says, hey, mom's funeral was $5,000. So if everyone pitches in $1,000, you know, we can cover it. And some of them will say, oh, I'm sorry, that money's already spent, right? So I, I, if I need to create a pot of money for her to access and cover my debts and my expenses, then I can do that through the trust and then allow her to make the distributions. If I'm worried, I don't like one of my kids' spouses and I wanna protect the money from that spouse, if I want to make sure that my child who hasn't paid their student loans, you know, doesn't have to use that money to pay student loans. Um, if I'm worried that I'm going to give $100,000 to a 20 year old and it's, you know, their, their dad is going to be able to talk them out of that money. Um, if I need to control distributions, like say I want my boyfriend to live in the house for 20 years and I want my kids to not be able to sell it out from under him, but then I, want, I don't want him to get a new girlfriend and give the house to her. So I can you know, control that through the trust. I had a client in yesterday who had a, a 10 children and he wanted four of the children to be beneficiaries. So if I do a will, Arizona requires that even if he makes the four kids the beneficiaries, I have to tell all the 10 kids what he did and in a trust, I only have to tell the actual beneficiaries what we're doing. So for him, even though he just has one piece of property, it's appropriate because he because then we don't have to notice the other six beneficiaries. I call it poking the bear because they get this letter. Hey, there's, you know, four hundred thousand dollars in this house. You don't get it. There's a lawsuit open at the court. If you have an objection or you think you're supposed to get it, here's where you file. So it's nice to, for privacy, if we're disinheriting someone or leaving someone out to not have to have it go through probate. Um, or, you know, maybe we want to protect the beneficiaries from themselves. Maybe we have substance abuse issues or different things like that. So anytime, any, or special needs. So say I, my, I want to leave money to my sister but she hasn't planned very well or she doesn't have a lot of assets. So I know that she's probably going to need long-term care and the state's going to have to cover it for her. I wanna help with that, but I don't want to cause a problem where now she's ineligible for benefits. So I can leave her money through the trust and put some special needs provisions in there just in case. And so if that happens, she can go on state benefits and she doesn't have to spend down the inheritance money that I left her. So those are, those are some of the reasons. So it, the question isn't always, you know, do I need a trust? My, my response is always, what, what are we trying to do? So the trust is a document that it, usually we're talking about a revocable living trust. And so I'm the person who set it up. I'm the person who can change it. That's the grantor, creator, um, and then I'm, I want to be the trustee, which is the person who signs and gets to invest the money. And then I say, if I can't do that. This is who my next person is. And then I want to be the beneficiary as long as I'm alive so that I can use my own money. And then when I pass away, I can put all those protective provisions in there for my next beneficiary. So um, that, that's what the trust, it's a contract. The important thing about it and why it works so well is because I don't own the property anymore in my name. I put it in the trust name. So Laura Johnson doesn't own it. The Johnson Living Trust owns it. That trust doesn't pass away. The title doesn't have to be changed if the person who set it up passes away. It automatically transitions to the next thing that I've designated within the trust. So when I pass away, it still stays in the Johnson Living Trust. My son takes it over and he can make those distributions to the, be the next beneficiaries. I don't have to, sorry, go ahead. Did somebody have a question? Okay, so, so let's see, we have a couple questions. It says, um, is it too late to get something set up? No, 
just because someone's been diagnosed with dementia doesn't mean they're incapacitated. Um, so you absolutely can go do documents. That capacity requires the attorney to be able to sit down with the person and ask who their children are, or their spouse, and in the moment, if they can answer that and they can kind of conceptualize what a power of attorney does, what what a will would do, then you can. They still have legal capacity. Now, if it's a fourth marriage on both sides, then we have four sets of kids on both sides, and everybody hates each other. You know, you might not want to do it that way, but. Um, Legally, the person can have capacity. Uh, let's see, my dad is in long-term care and he has no assets and he has Alzheimer's, does he need a will? Not usually, um, if there's no will, there's, there's intestate statutes that say, first it goes to the spouse, then it goes to the biological children of that person and it goes down that line. Um, okay, so let's see. So the important thing to remember about the trust is always to get the assets in it. So that, that's called funding a lot of times. So if, and different attorneys do funding different ways and it kind of depends on what you're trying to accomplish. So Arizona has a payable on death form for cars. So usually we don't like, in my office, I don't like to hold the cars in the trust because it makes it really complicated at motor vehicle to get them changed. So we just usually fill out the form that says, if we pass away, we still own this car, then it goes into the trust. It just makes it really easy for the trustee. The house goes in the trust, the investment accounts go in the trust. Um, so, so that at the end of the day, we can get all of those protections. So a lot of times we get asked about IRAs and how those work. So it, it depends on who your beneficiaries are and why we're doing the trust. So if I have, I just had a 26 year old woman come in who has a six year old son and she wants him to get the IRA, but she doesn't want the biological father to have anything to do with it because he's not responsible. So I can name the trust as the beneficiary of her IRA. She has four stage, she's in four stages of cancer. So when she passes away, um, the money will go to who she's established under the trust and they will be able to hold that money and, and work with the biological father to get the baby taken care of because she hasn't been able to sever his rights, but she doesn't want to make it more appealing for the father to argue for parental custody because he knows that there's money that comes with the baby. So in that situation, we want to name the trust as the beneficiary. If we have a special needs beneficiary or something like that, we want to use the trust to do that. If I have two kids and the parents have no concerns and they're doing great and they should get it, then I'm going to name the two kids and only the trust as a backup as the beneficiary. If I have a spouse, Spousal rollovers are gold because it's the only situation where you can take that IRA and make it your own and not have to have it paid out within that 10 year or one year period. So I've, if I have a spouse and there's, and there's not an obvious reason not to, I'm always going to name the spouse as the beneficiary before the trust, if we're using the trust. So it just depends on what we're trying to accomplish. So probate is the same exact process as a trust administration. So when someone passes away, first we're going to read what the documents say and what we're supposed to do. We're gonna give notice to all of the people who have an interest. We're gonna figure out what assets there are. We're gonna make sure that no one can come in the house and take the personal property items. We're going to give creditors a chance to make claims. And, and validate those, those creditors. We're gonna pay the taxes, we're gonna pay the debts, we're gonna pay the expenses. And then we're gonna make a proposal for distribution to the beneficiaries with an accounting. Here's what I got at the, you know, here's what I got at the beginning. Here's what I did with it over this period of time. Now, because the trust or the will said you get a fifth, 
here's what I think you should get. And then those beneficiaries sign off on that distribution and on that accounting. It happens the same way in the probate. The difference is we just have some different rules, more stringent rules governing the probate, and we have to do it all through the court system, but the same type of process. So if I, so, so there's a lot of gray area in, in the trust administration process and in the probate process, like how long do I wait to sell the house and who do I use as a realtor and um, how much do I want to pay for the funeral and am I going to take a fee and what is that fee and uh, you know who am I going to reimburse for what am I going to pay for everyone to come in for the funeral so so those are a lot of gray areas so if I have a lot of family members who don't get along and they're making some of those decisions, even though they're legal, they're within their legal right to do so, people can still be very catty with each other. So just, it's really, really important that you're thinking about how that would work in reality with your people that you're naming, if that makes sense. So we've talked a little bit about out-of-state documents. A trust would be honored in Arizona from another state. The only trick is that the trust will say in it, this trust will be interpreted according to the laws of Pennsylvania, or this trust will be interpreted according to the laws of New York. Arizona doesn't have an estate tax. We don't have an inheritance tax. A lot of states do. And so you just have to always be careful that you're not subjecting yourself to something that you don't want to be subjected to, if that makes sense. So you can always take your trust and, and say, okay, we were in Hawaii, but now we're in Arizona. So we're going to just redo, restate that trust to say we're going to be subject to Arizona rules. It's a, it's a pretty simple process, especially if we already have all the assets in it. The, the, getting the assets in it is the headache usually. So I know that um, you can my competition is not other attorneys. My competition is LegalZoom and your CPA and your financial advisor and all of those kinds of people. Um, thank goodness for LegalZoom because I will have work for the rest of my life because people go on there and they're not quite sure what they're filling out and, and, and they do all kinds of crazy things. But um, it, it, we don't know if it's going to work until it doesn't work. So there are some things, I'm a huge coupon shopper, but there's some things that are just worth paying for. So that there's my commercial right there. Um, and, and I just want to be clear that not everyone needs a trust. And sometimes a trust is going to cause problems and make it harder for us. So like, for example, I had a client in today whose husband needed long-term care benefits. And we do a lot of Medicaid planning, all text planning to help people get those benefits. So she kept saying, my friends tell me that I need a trust. But if she has any assets in a trust or he has any assets in a trust, we're gonna have to take that out in order to get him qualified for those benefits. So I could charge her a lot of money, put a trust together because her friend said that's what she was supposed to do. But then I know that in six, 12 months, I'm going to have to take that all back out and, and go through this process with her. So it's, it's not a good fit for her, but there are other things we can do to solve her concerns. So there's a lot of situations like that where, where we don't want to trust. And a trust is not magical. There's no such thing as I have a trust, so no one can contest what's going on. Anyone can contest anything. There can be language in the trust that says, if you do contest, you're disinherited. And, and I think that's a great thing to put in a trust and in a will. There's no magical, even if you have a trust and you have everything in it, there's still a chance that you could have to do a probate at some point because maybe I have a trust and I have everything in there and I get in a car accident and now money comes in from that lawsuit. That's always going to come to my estate. So even if I have a trust, I always have what's called a pour over will that says, hey, if those things come in, it's going to go to the trust. So my pour over will says, 
Laura Johnson's estate will be paid to her trust. And that's super important because we need a way to get that over there for the protection. So it, so just wanted to bring that up. Let's see. A lot of times I see a lot of people get really, really nervous about um, having assets and they hear people talk and you need to get rid of your house or you need to so that you don't have it and you can qualify for benefits or something like that. Just be really, really careful um, how you do that because there's always cons there's always pros and cons to each decision you make. So if I um, if I'm my family calls me and they say, hey, can you pay for your granddaughter's tuition? I just need to know in the back of my mind that if I pay for someone else's tuition and in the next five years, I have to qualify for Medicaid, I'm gonna have to wait a period of time to get Medicaid because I made that gift and I could have used that money for my long-term care. If I get nervous and I transfer my house to my son and say, here, you hold the house in your name, and then we need to sell the house so that um, we can you know, have more cash or something like that. Because I gifted it to him and then we sold it, we're gonna have to pay capital gains on whatever is the difference from when I bought it to when he sold it. If I sell it out of my name, we pay no capital gains most of the time because it's my primary residence. Um, so, and it's the same with stock. So if I give him the stock, and then he sells it, he pays capital gain. If I let him have it when I pass away, then he doesn't pay any capital gain when he sells it. So there's a lot of tax questions and, and long-term care questions that are involved in, you know, do you put that other person's name on the house or those kinds of things. Um, if you have someone on your house, so it, one of the reasons why it's nice to use the beneficiary deed is because that doesn't give anyone rights in your home um, until you've passed away and you still have that property and it goes to them. So if I put my son on my house with me as a joint tenant, not a, not a beneficiary, but as a joint tenant with me, he owns half the house. So if I get remarried and he doesn't like my spouse and we go to move into a bigger place and he says, no way, I'm not selling my part in the house. I think it's a good investment. I want you to keep it. I'm not selling the house because no one wants to buy half a house. So you give that person control when you put them in an ownership position uh, over the home or those other different types of assets. If I put him on my bank account, he can you know, be desperate and go in there and clean out my bank account if he wants to. So if my son just got out of prison for um, fraud or something like that, he should probably not be on my bank account, right? Everybody not. Okay. <laughs> All right. So if we, if we don't do these kinds of estate planning, or if it's not clean, or if we have multiple people on there, um, then we're going to, then what we do is we have a process that we go through court. So if someone is making some unsafe decisions, they're a danger to themselves or others, but we don't have healthcare powers of attorney or we, we can't get the doctor to work with us, then we're going to court to do a guardianship, which gives someone authority over that person to make their personal decisions. If you have the powers of attorney and it's working and people are working with you, you never want to go do a guardianship. This is a, this is a situation of last resort. Sometimes people will say, do I have to have my person declared incompetent? No, that happens through letters with the doctor, not through this court process. If someone is making unwise financial decisions, like I just had a client um, pay $10,000 to have a tree removed from their front yard that didn't exist. So in that situation, when we need to lock down the funds so that this person can't take advantage of them, then I've got to go to court and do a conservatorship. So sometimes it's, sometimes we do both. Sometimes we do one. It's easier. The burden of proof is easier to get a conservatorship over someone than a guardianship. So it's harder to prove 
that I need to take over their personal decisions and their financial. If I have a conservatorship, I also then have the pleasure of doing an accounting for the court every single year about what I've done with every dime for that person. So how much did I pay on a haircut? What did we pay when we went out to lunch? Is their estate sustainable? Um, why am I spending that much money on that thing? And it's very, even if I'm married, I get to do this. So I just had someone who needed to get his wife into long-term care and their main asset was her IRA. It, was a, it had about $150,000 in it. And so he needed to go in and get that money out of the IRA, but she was at the point where she was nonverbal. He didn't have a power of attorney. So we had to go do a conservatorship so that, and then he had to account to the court for every single thing he was doing with that IRA money, even though they had been married 60 years. So super, super important to have those powers of attorney in place. Um, I can, I joke with people and I can say, I tell them, I can do wonderful, fabulous legal documents for you, but if you pick the wrong person to be your decision maker, we're going to be in trouble. So it's super, super important that you really, really think about how you want this to work. If you're married to someone who has dementia or shouldn't be making your decisions, you probably, you probably don't want to name them on your documents. If, if your stomach hurts when you think about that person being in charge of you, you don't want to name them on your documents. If, if you're just baffled by the, if you start laughing at the thought of someone taking over your bank account and paying your bills, they should not be named as your decision maker. So um, that's super, super important. So what do you do? What do you do if you don't have anyone? If I don't, if my, if I don't have children or I don't trust them or, so there's a couple resources. One, you can, um, you can use a corporate fiduciary, which is like a bank, but they usually have now a requirement of at least $5 million in investable assets. And obviously their interest is in the investments, not in care management or making sure that I'm taken care of or those kinds of things. So what do I do if I don't have that? I, then I can use a private licensed fiduciary. Arizona has a program where that people can, who have degrees, they can go through a internship process with a licensed fiduciary. They take a test, they're licensed and bonded, and then they're authorized through the Arizona Supreme Court to be someone's decision maker. They get audited every single year on a certain percentage of their cases. Obviously, it takes a lot of finesse to do that kind of work. So it's like a physician, like an attorney. There's some that are great. There's some that aren't great. But there are some really good fiduciaries out there who do a lot of good work. They take hard people who have mental health issues. They burned out their families. Um, so they like to work with people who that's not the case with. So you can absolutely name them in a backup position. So say all my kids are in Minnesota but I wanna have a relationship with someone here in case the kids can't do it or I'm having my siblings do it and they're older and I'm not sure if they'll be around. I can put the, the fiduciary in a backup position to those people or I can name them as the primary. I can also reach out to a geriatric care manager which is like a private social worker who my family can hire to report back to. So if the kids are saying, mom, I think you're not safe at home. You need to be, move into assisted living. And I think I'm just fine. And they won't leave me alone. Hey, come back and live in Minnesota. You love the snow. No, I didn't, you know, that kind of thing. Then, then they can hire a geriatric care manager to come work with me and say, okay, She'll be safe at home if we can do this. And then we can kind of negotiate a safer situation because my decision maker's job is to keep me safe in the least restrictive environment. So for some kids, that means they come in and take over your life and you don't have any choices anymore. And there, but there are others that can finesse that a little better and using a geriatric care manager is a good, a good option for some of that. Now, if I name, if I name someone, 
um, who I haven't told or who doesn't know where to find paperwork or I haven't left instructions for them, that can make things really messy. So it's super important to document, um, make sure that the person can, so if I put my super awesome documents that I created so that we don't have to do a probate in a safety deposit box that no one has access to, and they have to do a probate to get access to the super important documents that I created so I didn't have to do a probate, that's messy, right? So if I put them in a safety deposit box, make sure that my person has access to it. If I tell them it's on my nightstand, I need to make sure it's on my nightstand. And, and I would, and it's not just the legal documents, it's also, there's no way that this person, there's no magical place for them to go to where they can find out what my assets are and what I'm paying every month and all of this kind of thing. So I should be making lists of, you know, what are my passwords and what, do, what gets automatically paid and what bills do I have each month and who's my doctor and what meds do I take? Because if I get in an accident, all of that information is lost. And if I'm a caregiver for my spouse, even more of that information is lost because all that's in my head. So it's super important to put together a caregiver notebook with my estate planning documents. So that's there. This is the website for the document storage for the state for the healthcare documents. Um, and I get emails every day from other attorneys asking if people have documents for them. So these documents get lost all the time. And I don't necessarily think that the best place to store them is in a safety deposit box. I think it's fine to do it in your home, but the person just needs to know how to get to them and where they are. Um, and, and one of the other things that's fought about extensively is what someone wants when they pass away as far as their burial is concerned. So it's super important to document that because some people have less money and they want more money out of the estate and they don't wanna pay $25,000 for your funeral. Or um, someone thinks you're, that your decision maker is a horrible, horrible person because they just had you cremated and you told them you didn't want a funeral, but they don't believe it. So those things are fought over all the time. And if all of, if my five kids are arguing, regardless of what I put together, there's a good chance that I'm going to be sitting there in a, in a little thing at the coroner's office for 14 days until they fight it all out. So anything I document and make super clear if I prepay, if I write it all out, that's very, very helpful to, um, get through this process. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to create a situation where I haven't been clear. So now they have five different ideas of what the right thing to do is, and they can't agree. So now they hate each other for the rest of time and never talk to each other again. So I have a responsibility to document all of that so that they don't misunderstand what I want. And if I don't care, I think it's important to say I don't care. I don't care what you guys do when I pass away. Do whatever you want. Um, if you're open to putting more uh, documentation together for end of life choices, this is a great document. I think it's $5. Um, and it, it goes through, it's written by hospice physicians and it goes through and outlines what you can do um, for end of, you know, do you want to be treated for cancer? What kind of, when you talk about comfort measures, what does that mean? Uh, and it, it goes through obvious things like, I don't want you fighting in my hospital room, you know, that kind of thing. But I think that's important to document because it really helps your decision maker um, kind of state the obvious sometimes. So, okay. Now, I think probably most of you know this, but Medicare doesn't cover non-medical long-term care. So I can always get help for sh on a short-term basis for six weeks or something for bathing or, or um, in-home care meals or things like that. But long-term, if I have dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lou Gehrig's disease, something like that, that's not covered beyond usually like 120 days. So if I need someone to help me get to the restroom, get food, 
get dressed, those kinds of daily activities, then either I'm going to privately pay for it, or I will have a long-term care policy, or I will apply for Altex, which is our Medicaid program in Arizona, or I can also apply for a pension need and attendance through the VA. So the VA, even if you've never used any benefits through them, if you had 60 days active duty and one of those days was during wartime, even if you weren't in Vietnam or Korea, if you just were active duty during that time period, there are some benefits if, if you're spending a significant amount of your money on medical expenses or if you have a really low income and low assets. And, and Altex is a wonderful program. It covers in-home care, it covers assisted living, it covers, um, it covers skilled nursing. You have to qualify for it medically to so prove that you need that assistance medically. They have income criteria that you have to meet to qualify for it, as well as asset criteria. And that depends on if you're married or, or if you're single. So don't be afraid to meet with an elder law attorney and ask that, ask those questions. Because um, even if you don't qualify, there are ways that we can make you qualify. Sometimes it's not worth it to do those things, but it, there are ways to get you to qualify. So this, these are the websites for geriatric care managers who are the private social workers that you can hire. The website for licensed fiduciaries in Arizona as well as elder law attorneys, which focus not just on, you know, getting some documents in place, but also how is this going to work out in the future? Do we have the right person in place? How are we going to pay for things? Um, all, of, all of that as a has to be looked at holistically. Okay, so let's see. Do we have any exciting questions? Um, Can, can a family member make financial arrangements without a will? I'm not sure what that means. So if someone has passed away, so if someone's alive and someone needed decisions to be made for them, you would use a financial power of attorney. If someone doesn't have a financial power of attorney, there's no surrogacy statute, you won't be able to make decisions for them. Now they could authorize you, like if you can, Sometimes you'll shove a piece of paper in front of them and say, here's your birthday, you know, here's your social, authorize me to talk to them. So sometimes they can give verbal authorization um, for a short period of time or something like that. But long term, you have to have that power of attorney. And if they lose that ability to give that authorization verbally, that causes a really big problem. Um, so a general power of attorney is usually a durable. Durable means usually it has language in it that says, I'm doing this today. I'm capacitated today. At some point I may become incapacitated. If that happens, these people are still who I want. So it's durable throughout that process from capacity to incapacity. Um, and some, some financial institutions require that language to be in there. If, if cars are co-named on title, then there's no need to worry. That's true. So if you have, so Arizona has three options. They have and, or, um, they have or, and they have and. And so if any of those are options, it goes to that other person. It's just different documentation um, when you go to them to remove that other person's name. Uh, money, yeah, money and family are always dicey. <laughs> Can CPAs write beneficiary deeds? Arizona doesn't really prosecute people for practicing law without a license. The problem is if it doesn't work or if they do it wrong, you don't have anyone that you can, you can go after when it doesn't work. So when someone passes and they say this beneficiary deed is invalid, you know, this is why you can't sue the CPA for doing that. You can the attorney. Um, so I, would, I have seen CPAs write beneficiary deeds. Um, and yes, lawyers know about that. Uh, and, and you can always do that. You can always do a beneficiary deed and you can always transfer a piece of property into a trust, 
even if there are liens or a mortgage on it. Because when you own a piece of property, you always have the vest, the current vesting deed that says, okay, my husband and I bought this piece of property. And that stays the same. And then we take out a loan on the property to buy it. And then the bank sells our loan. So they, they record a release of it. They, they record a deed of trust. Then when they sell my loan to another company, they record a release of the deed of trust. Then the new company records a new deed of trust. And then when I pay that off, they record a release of trust. Then I owe someone who worked on my roof and they put a lien on the house. So all of that sits on top of the vesting deed. You can always change the vesting deed to say, I own it or my, me and my husband own it, or I'm going to give it to my son or whatever I want. The, the trick with that though, is that when I have a certain kind of a mortgage or something like that, I always swear that I won't do that because my son hasn't guaranteed the loan. So if the mortgage company sees that I gave it to someone who's not the two of us, then they can call the loan. Um, perfect. Oh yeah, good. Somebody listed that, the licensing program. That's excellent. That's a better website actually. And it's important if you're thinking about naming someone to look at the, um, to look at the complaints against the fiduciaries and things like that. Just remember that everyone has complaints. It's, it's a really um, interesting job. And if any of you have watched that show on Netflix called I Care A Lot, super fun. Let's see, you mentioned the one to 10 year payout for the beneficiaries on IRAs. Oh, okay. So under the, um, I forget what it's called at the minute, but I wrote it in the presentation somewhere. Under the new rules that were passed to a year, a year and three months ago, um, the SECURE Act, there we go. Um, I, I can take any type of tax deferred accounts out over my lifetime in small amounts. And I just pay tax on the amount that I take out. If I give it to my spouse, they, they then take it into their name and they can take it out as slowly as they want based on their life expectancy. But what was happening was people were building up a million dollar, $5 million, $20 million IRAs. And I don't spend it. I pass it to my kids. They don't spend it. They pass it to their kids. They don't spend it. And the government was tired of not getting their taxes. So when the SECURE Act passed, it it changed all of that and said that once it's not me or my spouse, there's a couple exceptions, like if I have a special needs child or something like that, but they're not notable really. Um, but once I pass it to anyone that's not the two of us, then they have 10 years to pay all the tax on the IRA. And so they can choose to take that out, you know, a 10th each year, they can choose to take it out all at once, they can choose to take it out on the back end. I saw some numbers the other day that seemed to indicate that sometimes, based on the market right now, that um, sometimes you're gonna save money waiting till the 10th year and just taking it all out on the 10th year. Um, but that's basically the new rules under the SECURE Act, which makes the planning a lot different because previous to the SECURE Act, we were always trying to figure out we don't want to invalidate that ability to roll the IRA over and just continue that and defer the taxes, defer the taxes. Now we're having discussions like I did with my client today where I'm saying, how much money do your kids make? Oh, they have like, they have like $300,000 of income a year and you just have your social security technically on paper. You need to be taking more money out of your IRA because when it goes to them, they're gonna have to pay it their tax basis or their tax rate instead of yours. So you need to take extra out each year, which is counterintuitive to what we've had in the past. So I hope that answers that question. So the question is, since we don't know the future and there are two children to inherit our estate, it would be seemingly best to put our $500,000 into the trust. And so I, it depends. 
I, I always like to use a trust just to control for contingencies because I see crazy things happen all the time. But like, for example, say, say I have two children and I want to make sure that if one of them passes away, it goes to their children. If I have an account at Schwab and I have an account at Merrill Lynch and I name the two kids as the beneficiaries, Schwab will say, if, if one of your kids passes away, we're going to pay all the money to the other child. And Merrill Lynch will say, if one of your kids passes away, we're giving it to your estate. And then, you know, if there's another company, it will say, if one of the kids passes away, we're going to give it to the children. So I don't have any control. It's their policy when I use beneficiary designations. I also have no safety net if something unexpected happens, like they pass away together or, um, they didn't tell me that they were filing a bankruptcy and that they weren't being financially responsible. So any type of contingencies or unexpected things like that, um, we can accommodate for in a trust. And I think Jay is gonna give everyone access to the presentation. And, I, and he also has some frequently asked questions that are kind of in a different format. So if you just wanted to read through the information in a different way. Um, yeah, here, yeah, there's a sample beneficiary deed that you can use. That's a good. What website is mentioned earlier in the presentation about legal forms? Oh, okay. The Arizona Attorney General's website has a, um, what they call a life care planning packet. So if you just Google Arizona Attorney General, it'll come up with a health care power of attorney It'll come up with a mental health care power of attorney and a living will, um, and, and you can print all that out and it tells you exactly how to execute it. Do beneficiaries have to pay taxes upon receipt of the property? That's a good question. Arizona doesn't have an inheritance tax and we don't have an estate tax. So um, the tax is paid on the person who's giving the money, who's passing away. So I have in Arizona the legal right to pass away or to pass on $12 million to anyone that I want to. So I can do that during lifetime. If it's over $12,000 at one in one year during my lifetime, then I have to tell the IRS that I'm doing that so that they can take it off of my 12 million. So if I give away $100,000 this year, they're going to take that 85 85,000 off of my 12 million so that I can only give away 11 million, blah, blah, blah. Um, so no, they don't have to pay taxes on it when they receive it. And if they turn around and sell it, they're not going to pay taxes either unless it's an IRA and they have to pay income taxes or an annuity um, or something like that. So life insurance passes tax-free, the house passes tax-free, everything. Uh, if a trust is made by an attorney that dies and their office is closed, where does the copy of the trust go? That's a good question. Hypothetically and ethically, it's supposed to go to the Arizona bar and they're supposed to store it. But a lot of times that doesn't happen. And so that's why I never keep original documents for my clients here, just in case something crazy happened. And I don't want them to feel obligated to come back to me. So most of the time, attorneys will give the original to the client and they'll just keep a copy, but um, it should be handed over to the bar. And Jay put up the um, website for the, uh, for the life care planning packet. So you have it up there. Okay, any other questions? I did my first presentation in person last week and it was super fun to see a bunch of people out together talking to each other. It's easier to crack jokes when you're with people than online. Hey, Laura, there is one more question. Okay. We are out of state residents, but own property in Arizona. How does community property come into play? Um, so you can still do a beneficiary deed. Like I have a lot of clients that are Canadian citizens who do beneficiary deeds. Community property, if it depends on how you bought the property. So if when you bought it, 
you said, um, I'm assuming the question has to do with survivorship, but if, if I, um, when I buy the property, I say I own it as community property, the rights of survivorship. If I pass away, it goes to my husband. If he passes away, it goes to me. And then I put a beneficiary deed on it. So if both of us pass away, it goes to whoever. If I don't do that, then I have to do a probate on my out-of-state mm. property as well as my in-state property. So you get to do probate in multiple states, which is another reason why sometimes people use trusts. Now, as a as a side note, one of the huge advantages to community property is that when, if I'm in a separate property state and let's say I bought stock and I paid a dollar for it and now my stock is worth a hundred dollars in a, in a separate property state and I'm married, my husband can turn around and sell that property for a hundred dollars and he's gonna pay income tax, capital gains tax on half of that. If in a community property state, because our idea is we don't care who owns it, we don't care whose name is on it, everything's community. If you, you know, if, unless you said otherwise and you did a prenuptial agreement, then everything's community. So, because it doesn't matter about titling, you can't really track things. So, in a, in a community property state, if I pass away with that stock and my husband sells it the next day, we get a step up in basis of everything. So if it's my second home and it's my vacation home, you don't get that exemption amount. So it's a beautiful thing if you say it's community because when one, even if you're not in a community property state, you can declare it community. And then the first person passes away, you can sell your vacation property the next day and there's no, there's no capital gains tax. So I hope I hit the answer somewhere in there. <laughs> Any other questions? If you want to ask in person, go ahead and unmute yourself or raise your hand and I'll do that. It couldn't have been that comprehensive. <laughs> I think you did a fantastic job, Laura. I think you covered just about everything we could possibly come up with. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, All right. Well, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. We do have a question. J. Wayne Watson. Let me see if I can unmute you. I think they just wanted to tell you how good looking you are, Jay. Uh, you know what? I think I need a power of attorney now. <laughs> I clicked Maybe the other mute button. To, there you go. You got it. You found your mute button. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the information that you shared with us on the screen, how do we get a copy of that? That is a terrific segue. Um, I, I, thanks for bringing that up, Wayne. When we are finished here today, we are recording this workshop. Um, I will go ahead and download that. It'll take me anywhere from 24 to 48 hours to edit. Um, obviously, the early parts of the video that you know we hadn't started yet, and we will post that on the Benavia um, YouTube channel. So I will send you an email, everybody that's on the call. I, I will send you an email with the links to that and additional information that Laura will be sending me, and I have. I'll send you out links to that as well, and I'm going to send you a short link to a little survey. And if you could take just two minutes to fill it out. It kind of keeps us in line and lets us know what we're doing well and how we can improve these workshops for you, especially since, like Laura says, we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe we can start doing these in person again. So it will be coming out real soon. Okay, thanks a lot. You got Thanks for joining us, Wayne. And if it, if it was helpful, then, then I wrote the presentation. If it wasn't, I didn't. <laughs> You stole okay. off the internet, right? Right, right. <laughs> Jay wrote it for me. I didn't even know what it was going to say. Uh, I'll take the hit for it. <laughs> Actually, it was great. So thank right. you so much, Laura, for being with us. Absolutely. Thank it. you all for your time. I appreciate it. The contact information is there for Johnson & Associates, 623-505-3903. If you got any questions, 
And uh, if you're looking for some help, and I'm, I'm going to throw in a little quick story here before we leave. I first met Laura 20 years ago, maybe. Um, maybe not that long. I don't know. Getting close to the senility, <laughs> but you like it. You were you were doing my family's estate back in the day, and then I happened to retire. And long story short, I wound up coming to work for Benavia. And there's Laura again as a, a tremendous resource and partner. And I just can't say enough things about her and her company and the work they do in the community. So thank you, Laura. I love it. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. I always appreciate working with Benavia. And, and just someone asked if there's any discount, but I, you know, it's my business. I can charge whatever I want to. So if money is an issue, we can always talk about it. So just have to make sure my staff gets paid. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And today's presentation was free. So that's right. That was that's a lot right. of great information. And if you have any other questions, you know, feel free to call Benavia. I always like to say we're your first call if you don't know where to turn. 623-584-4999 will get the main desk and just let them know what questions you have and they'll get you in touch with the right people. So that's what we do here at Benavia. And we love to have our partners like Laura uh, supporting us out in the community. So with that said, thank you, everyone. Have a most wonderful afternoon. Enjoy the great weather out there. And go see some spring training games if you get a chance. Thank you. Take care. All right, everybody. Good afternoon.